My name is Earl Willis, Jr. Today is June the 5th. I work for the Warren County Public Library. We're in Bone Green, Kentucky, and today we're interviewing Mr. Bob Raby. Uh, Mr. Raby, where and when were you born? Uh, born on February the 2nd, uh, or February the 11th, I guess I should say, 1945 in Detroit, Michigan. Okay, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, so, uh, did you have your siblings, your your mother, your father, your grandfather, your your cousins, did you have anybody that was uh, in the, uh, the military? My dad was in the Army, my uncles, I had several uncles on his side whose brothers were in the military. Uh, had one uncle who was shot down, who I never met, um, in World War II. He was a pilot. Okay. Uh, do you feel as though that might have influenced you any, or did you talk about the military when you were younger? Or Well, I always felt extremely patriotic toward our country um, and felt, you know, when my time came, uh, I definitely wanted to serve, um, not aggressively where I would go and volunteer immediately especially after I got out of school and married and that type of thing. Okay. Uh, well, what were you doing before you entered the service? Well, I was uh, got married, I guess, uh, my second year in college at WKU. was working full-time uh, downtown in Bowling Green at uh, uh, one of the department stores and a men's clothing store, Golden Farley's. And it was taking nine hours and uh, at Western and married and really um, I guess I didn't understand to be a full-time student you had to have 13 which would have exempted you from the draft and I went home one day and had a letter in the mail said greetings from the President of the United States oh, really? you've been selected so I found out at that point that, that uh, and at that point it was too late I mean okay. I'd already been drafted. So how many hours of college were you, did you have I mean uh, I mean how many credits I mean how many hours were you taking at that semester? Only nine. Nine, and I okay. needed to have 13 to okay. be, be uh, deferred as a college student okay. so I wouldn't be, accept, uh, be, be exposed to the draft. Okay. Uh, so you said you were born in Michigan. So from Mich how long did you live in Michigan to go to from Kentucky? First two and a half years of my life. So I don't remember much about Michigan at all. Okay. Uh, I went back there when I was in the fifth grade for a vacation with my parents, met some of our family, okay. did some touring, that was about it. Okay. So... Uh, there was it like a job for your father to come to Kentucky? It was a combination of jobs and uh, basically they're just wanting to be back in this part of the country to be close to their family. Okay, so your family had roots in Kentucky? Uh, my dad's family were down in Russellville, Kentucky. My mom's family was in Adairville, Shaco, there you're okay. familiar with. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, they just wanted to be closer to their parents and their, okay. you know, spout, their um, Brothers and sisters. So they, they probably were raised in the country, and they, they they probably wanted to get away from maybe the Chicago and Detroit area. Well, the city or, life in Detroit, I understood, was, was pretty hectic, especially at that particular time. I mean, in 1945, you're talking about wartime. War two, yeah. and 46 and 47, there was a lot of turmoil in the factories and unions and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, they just decided to come back home. Yeah. Uh, and what, what branch uh, did you serve? I served in the Army. In the Army, okay. Uh, so you've already answered this question, uh, the question about uh, were you enlisted or you drafted? You were drafted. Right. Okay. Do you remember like the, the uh, month or when you, did you, you came home and got your... your uh, yeah, I was working uh, and came home uh, at lunchtime. I lived on Nutwood, just two blocks from downtown Bowling Green, and uh, got the mail. And uh, my wife was at work, and uh, I had classes that afternoon. So I opened the letter when I saw it was, you know, from the Department of Army, of course, and uh, kind of depressed, to be honest with you, that day. How am I going to tell my wife? How am I going to tell my family that, you know, I, I really screwed up and wasn't a full-time student, thought I was, was married, thought that would take care of all of it. Uh, we went out to eat that night, and uh, accidentally one of our neighbors had seen my name in the newspaper as being a draftee. Oh, really? And she walked up and said, well, congratulations. I understand you're going into the military. Well, my wife and my mom and dad did not know it at that moment. It put me on the hot seat. So I feel kind of bad about they they were learning that uh, through someone else besides me. But it, it worked out fine. Did they, did they take it pretty well? or? No, not really. Okay. You know I mean, I was an only child, and, yeah, and, and it really upset my mom quite a bit, and my wife. Uh, but... But, um, of course, this was like the Vietnam era, so they were probably worried right. about your, your safety. And they, they were pretty 
confident that that's probably where I would end up, which okay. I did. Okay. Uh, so do we talk about you were, you went to the Army. Do you remember when you, uh, so from when you got your letter in the mail to go on the basic training, how many months was that? I think uh, three, three two months. or three months, something. I wouldn't just maybe eight weeks, probably was okay. two months. And I had to report to the draft board, and then we left here from the federal building on a bus, went to Nashville, um, flew out of Nashville to uh, Columbus, Georgia, Fort Benning, Georgia, okay. to report. Do you do you always like to ask people, do you remember when you were sworn in? You Absolutely. Yeah, it was a federal building in Nashville uh, at that time. Of course, I left early that morning, like 4 o'clock, to report to the, to the board downtown in Bowling Green, and, you know, don't sleep much the night before no. realizing you're going to be gone. Uh, but when we stood up and took the oath, uh, I was fully aware of what was ahead and, and very much committed to it, very opposed to having read about a lot of people taking off to Canada and renouncing the country and so forth. So I, I felt obligated and had a sense of responsibility to want to, uh, and pride. Yeah. So you, were, so you 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 had read and saw where uh, people had, like, went to weren't the candidate or maybe burn or draft notices and stuff. So you took you took pride in, in doing your duty and being sworn Absolutely. in? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so do you, uh, is it, was it kind of surreal when you got sworn in, like you knew what you were? Well, yeah, at that time, I mean, you're there with, you know, a hundred other guys in a room and uh, you're, you're, you see all this government stuff around and military people in front of you raising your hand and taking the oath and, uh, yeah, it, it was real. I mean, yeah. I guess it wasn't quite as real as when I landed at uh, at Fort Benning, Georgia, and uh, saw the Army base and the barracks and all the other soldiers training. Uh, that that was a real eye opener at that point. So did you uh, you did you fly there? Or did you ride a bus to Fort Benning? Uh, we flew. Flew. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you remember how you 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 thought you you felt when you were flying? Was Sick it, in my stomach. Was, yeah. Because yeah, because were people. I've asked people, and they say a lot of times they're scared, they're nervous, they're excited, just a mixture of everything. Just that pretty well describes it, yeah. yeah. I, I, I was obviously sick of my stomach. Yeah. Uh, really not wanting to leave home, not leave my wife, not knowing what was ahead, you know, all those kinds of questions just yeah. fumbling through your head. Uh, so when you, when you got to Fort Benning, what were some of your first impressions that really, like, do you remember, that was what, maybe... What, 45 years, 50 years ago, 45 years ago? Uh, 52 or so, I guess, yeah. something like that. Uh, yeah, when we, we got off <clears throat> got off the airplane, we got on a, a dark green military bus, and they bust us all out to uh, Fort Benning to uh, uh, a department of the area called Churchill. And uh, when I got off the bus, there was a drill sergeant standing out there with a half of a, a cue stick and he was slapping against a, a empty garbage can, calling us every name under the sun. And you know, we didn't have a mother, we didn't have anybody. He was going to be our, our mother, our everything, uh, at that time for the next eight to nine weeks. And uh, it's kind of a little bit, you know, uh, uh, intimidating, I guess to say the least. Yeah. Uh, do you, did you have any uh, instructors that stood out in your mind? Yes, I did. I had a, a, a black drill sergeant, ironically his name was Sergeant White, who passed away maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, who I really credit with my being here right now. I mean, he said, you listen to me, and uh, where you're going, you're going to come back okay. And uh, I, I, I was like a sponge. I mean, I soaked in every detail that, that he told me. In fact, we went out to the punji stick um, uh, drill area and he called me out as the first trainee that day and he just knocked the fire out of me. I just walked up to him and he called my name, you know, and, and he hit me up. We had football helmets on and we had these big long sticks with two yeah. things on the end and he just cold cocked me and I went to the ground. And uh, so I got up on my knees and when I did, I just took mine and I just wailed him and knocked him down. And uh, he got up and laughed about it. He said, and I said, Troops, he says, this is exactly the lesson I want you to see. Uh, he said, you may get hit once, but don't let it happen twice. Take every opportunity to get your enemy any way you can. And he put his arm around me, and at that point, 
he kind of like adopted me, I guess, for the rest of uh, basic training because he seemed to to uh, come up and talk to me and tell me things that he had done that he didn't seem to tell other people. I don't know why he chose me, but I guess he did that with every group. Do you think you maybe saw your fighting spirit? Uh, at that point, probably, yeah. I wasn't going to take you know anything off of anybody. I weighed about 195 pounds and, and looked like a football player at the time. Yeah. Now I don't. Uh, my chest is gone to my drawers. I guess you could say I'm in the furniture business. But anyway, uh, he, he did. He really instilled a lot in me that yeah. I appreciate. Yeah. So that so that really that when you when you were and we'll talk about maybe your service overseas was one of the, any times overseas that you thought about him. Absolutely. There, there were a number of occasions. Uh, I actually was in uh, 38 combat situations where we were in firefights, and, and almost every single one of those, there was something that we engaged that I remembered uh, Sergeant White telling me about, and, and I contribute that to helping me survive. Yeah, I know, because a lot of times when, you, when somebody, you, you, you see somebody that, they, that you respect them and they have knowledge, like, you know, I have my, my father or somebody, you, you, when you're in a certain situation, you hear somebody's mind talk. I mean, this is what the, right. it, you know, I remember that. So that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did you, uh, how did you react to the training, the physical training? Did it was something you enjoyed or was you in pretty was, good shape? You like you were I was in pretty good shape, but I was in excellent shape when I left basic training. I mean, uh, you know, we had, um, to get into the, bar to get into the uh, uh, lunchroom, the, the mess hall, we had to uh, swing through these, whatever you call them, I can't even remember it now, um, overhead bars, well, we call them monkey bars. Yeah, monkey playground. bars. Yeah. And you, if you dropped off, you had to go back and start all over again. And then you had to do like 20 push-ups. And so every, three times a day, we went through that regimen. But of course, there was physical exercise every morning at Reveille, and, and we had to run. And, and it, you know, it was just the basic grinding thing that you had to go through to get yeah. your body and mind physically fit and ready to, to end, I guess, go into anything. Because that, that reminds me of some of the other interviews I've had. I remember talking to, uh, uh, he was a, a pilot in World War II, and he said when he woke up to go to breakfast, he had to walk about a mile. So I guess that sometimes we take for granted when we go to lunch or supper or wherever, we just kind of casually you know, go three or four feet or whatever, and right. people are, you know, doing exercises or walking two or three miles? Oh, during basic training, we had to run everywhere. There was no walking. They would not let you walk. You know, you were with your platoon, and the drill sergeant would come out, and he'd instruct us, we're going here, going there, and we'd start out with a cadence, and we'd be running. So it, it was it was hard, but at the same time, when I look back on it now, I wouldn't take anything for my training. Um, of course, I don't think anybody wants to go into combat, but, but the training aspect of it was... was uh, Tremendously helpful. Uh, you, uh, from you being a Kentucky boy, did when you did some of your like your uh, your rifle training, your small arms training, did, that, did you did that like give you an advantage? Do you think? Uh, I don't know. My my family, my dad's side of the family was always into hunting. Okay. So at an early age, I started firing a rifle. You know, okay. squirrel hunting, rabbit hunting, pheasant, pigeon, anything that that was an animal that yeah. was legal to go yeah. after. We were always hunting and. Uh, I, I was, uh, um, I, I qualified expert in, in all weapons I was trained in. Was that the, the M16? Was that the M16? Well, we started with the M1 in basic M1? training. In advanced uh, training, we went to the M16. Okay. okay. Uh, so, do you remember uh, writing back and forth to your mother and your father or your, your wife? Do you, do you remember, did you get to do much? Yeah, we, we were instructed. In fact, we were encouraged to do that, especially on weekends. We didn't have a lot of time. You get up at four o'clock in the morning. You go to bed at eight or nine o'clock at night after you got everything done, and we were exhausted. And then sometimes they'd come in, and wake us up at two o'clock in the morning, go on special runs, you know, three or four or five miles, and come back and you just fall out in the bunk. So, yeah, we we rode our families, and uh, later on it became almost a daily thing, especially when we got overseas. If we had time or we were back in our, in our uh, you know, a safe zone, we'd do that. Yeah. Was your, I guess your mother, your mother and father were pretty proud of you? I would like to think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, did the time in your, at boot camp, did it seem like it lasted forever or just go real fast? Uh, it drug the first two or three weeks. The last uh, few weeks it went by in a hurry. Uh, did not get a, a uh, 
break between uh, basic training and then advanced training. Uh, they, in fact, the way it, it, I don't want to get ahead of your questions, but the way it all came out when we graduated from basic training, um, drill sergeant came out and he picked five of us out and he said, I need you guys to go into the barracks. And we went in, we took some written tests and um, about this was about like two o'clock in the morning and being exhausted. Um, he came back in, he said, okay, you three guys come with me. And I was one of the three. We went outside, I went back to the barracks, got all of our personal gear, loaded it up, got into a, a, a van and went to a place called Fort McClellan, Alabama, okay. which is Anniston, Alabama. And uh, at that time when we drove in, it was probably eight o'clock in the morning by the time we got there from Columbus, um, there were all these buildings with grass uh, over the top of the roofs and it said welcome to Vietnam and we knew at that point where we were destined to go. Well, Anniston, Alabama was a special training for long range recon specialists. So at that point I knew pretty well what my MOS was going to be and where I was going to go and what I was going to be doing. Okay. And then we went through eight really difficult weeks of training at Fort McClellan. And, uh, and there was a Sergeant Potts that um, he didn't like anybody and nobody liked him. And anybody that had an axe to grind, they would try to take it out on him. But he was um, ex-Special Forces. He knew everything, hand, all hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was tough. And he really instilled in us, if you want to stay alive, listen to me. If you don't, you come back in a black bag. So he was probably the second guy in my time in the military that I, I really listened to. Uh, I hated him, but I listened to him. <laughs> He had some, uh, I guess he had, uh, he had knowledge that you wanted to. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. He'd been, I think, uh, at least two tours in Nam um, and uh, was signed up to go again. It, but I, I think he had had an injury and they wouldn't take him back. Okay. Uh, can you go in maybe what your actual MOS was and maybe your, your training after you left? Are well, you, are you, can you? Yeah, I, I mean, the MOS doesn't really mean a whole lot in the military because if, if you're qualified to do certain things and they find out about it, they're going to put you in the slot where you need to go. And that's why they, they kind of chose the three guys that left uh, Columbus at Fort Benning and went to Fort McClellan. And when we got there, uh, I immediately knew that we were going to be put into long-range recon, which is basically you go out for five or six days into the jungle and you observe the enemy and you radio back to your, your headquarters or CP uh, to tell them what you observed, what you saw, what the enemy's doing. And then there are special assignments that you're given to pull off, uh, whether it's an ambush site or whether it's to retrieve a, a enemy officer, or it might be a POW had been taken captive and you're tracing them, trying to find out if you can get him back, which that was part of our assignment at various times. We went into, um, when we landed at um, Cameron Bay, and Cameron Bay is where everybody went in, and it was surrounded by the South Korean rock soldiers, Marines basically, and they were vicious fighters. In fact, Cameron Bay was never uh, assaulted by the Viet Cong or North Vietnamese ever in the 10 years that we were involved. Now they had mortar fire that came in, of course, but the, the Viet Cong were terrified. and. Uh, I guess to illustrate that, I had when I landed at Cameron Bay after they gave us all our equipment and told us we were going to be there for two days before they assigned us to a unit, uh, I had gone to the PX. And I came out, and I vividly remember this, I was drinking a cold Coke, which was, was an unusual thing in Vietnam. Most of the time it was cold beer and hot drinks. But um, I had a Coke and, and some chips or something, and I see this Jeep coming up in front of the PX. And, there's dust behind it, and I noticed there's some kind of a big ball behind it on a long rope. And these two South Korean rock soldiers stopped, got out of the Jeep. Well, there were several of us that had come out of the PX by that time. And we looked back at the end of the rope, and it was a, a Viet Cong that had been captured and uh, interrogated what was left of him. They drug him. And they drug him, too, and he, of course, expired at some point during that. Uh, and that, that probably, uh, didn't make that coke and ships go down real well. If you no. know my drift, you know. Yeah. That was my first real exposure 
to seeing something that horrific other than automobile accident here in the States when yeah. I was a kid growing up. So know. this is, when you're talking about this, you were in, you were in Vietnam? At time. that time, yeah. Okay. I'd already landed in Vietnam okay. and was getting settled in for those two or three days as they were assigning us to what unit we were going to. Okay. So the, the same like the South Koreans were probably no, probably no holds bar and they were yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, even to this day, I, I think if I had to choose somebody to fight beside of, uh, besides an American soldier who was mad, uh, it would be a South Korean rock military marine. Okay. The, the American soldiers are probably the most lax soldiers in the world uh, until you make them mad, and then if you look at them cross-eyed, they'll kill you. And, and, and that's proof. I mean, yeah. every war we've ever been in. Yeah. Uh, so... A lot of times I like to ask people, and you can talk about things that you won't, don't want to talk about or whatever, but if it was a, such a thing as an average day when you were uh, you started your, uh, uh, your, your career in uh, your time in Vietnam, what would be like an average day, the time you woke up to? Well, to be honest with you, I don't think we slept more than probably, especially after we got into uh, being there for a while, we probably didn't sleep more than two hours a night out of just pure fear and, and uh, what was going on around you. I mean, you'd hear a branch, you know, break and, and you were just immediately on guard. Um, the first three days we were there, I slept pretty good because we were in a, a pretty secure area and, and I wasn't accustomed to uh, hearing uh, artillery weapons going off and, and uh, helicopters and planes and everything, you know, just, just war experience, period. Uh, but then... Uh, the time came where I was assigned to the first air calf, and uh, they came in in choppers and picked up probably a dozen of us and took us immediately to Quan Tri province, which was close to the DMZ, close to the Shaw Valley. And uh, we were dropped off and immediately assigned to uh, that uh, second battalion, the first air calf. Uh, had a, uh, a lieutenant and a captain that came up to us, and uh, he, he called the three of us that, that had left Fort Benning, Georgia, went to Anniston, went to Nam, stayed together through that entire time. And we were told that we were going to be assigned to uh, a special operations group that was going to be based um, in a place where history will never acknowledge we were, which okay. was Cambodia and yeah. Laos. Yeah. And uh, we, were, we stayed there maybe a week. Uh, getting familiar with all the weapons, all the stuff that we were going to have. We were given uh, Tiger-type uh, uniforms, which is a darker color than the average soldier. He had plain dark green. Ours was camouflaged. With the black stripes, yes. Tiger stripe. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then after that, uh, we were flown uh, to a base camp in, in that place where I said we weren't ever supposed, supposed to be. be yeah. But actually, we were on a hillside that overlooked uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And many of our assignments were in that particular area. Two assignments into uh, into North Vietnam. We were dropped to retrieve POWs, uh, which we did. Fortunately, one we didn't. Months later, we weren't able to get him. Um, but our days were just, you know, long and drawn out, tiring. Uh, I probably when I came back to the states after everything, I would spend 18, 19 hours of sleep. You know, just just exhausted, yeah. and uh, but but a lot of guys would tell you the same thing. Uh, I know this sounds like something that, that people would ask you in the movies, but since you weren't supposed to be in that place, we said you you weren't really weren't supposed to be. Did you have? Did you use uh, American weapons, or did you use like uh, North Vietnamese weapons? Because technically, well, I guess I'm probably not supposed okay. to. Okay, well, we won't talk but, about that. But uh, there were there were. There was no sign of anything American. that was made in America. Okay. Even the weapons we used okay. were confiscated weapons from either North Vietnamese or, or the Viet Cong. Uh, the food we ate was Vietnamese food. Uh, if a guy smoked, he smoked a, a cigarette or a cigar or whatever okay. that was made in Vietnam. And the reason why, when you sweat, the odor gives off. Yeah, yeah. And if you're in, in the bush, and let's say you're pulling off an uh, ambush site, you know, they, they, they could smell you if you were an American. I mean, our guys would chew bubble gum and smoke, you know, Lucky Strike or yeah. whatever and drink beer. And when they'd sweat, 
that would come out. And the, the Vietnamese were extremely good at picking up on any of that. Yeah. So we were well trained and we had to go through that particular process in order to, to carry off the assignments we were given. Okay. Uh, so you, uh, you, you said that sometimes that you were, uh, you had, uh, you had a fight with the enemy and, and I don't ask this uh, lightly, but I, if you, if you don't want to talk about it, you, you don't have to talk about it. But okay. for, for, the, for the people who, who have never, never been in like a, a life and death situation, what would, what would, can you, is there way, any way you can describe that? Any? Probably the best way to describe it is, is I've talked to a number of people who said they just felt like they could never take the life of another human being. Um, there is something within us as human beings when you're put in that kind of a, that kind of a situation. I'm talking about a, a military conflict. I'm not talking about something out in our society today. Um, the idea to preserve life comes out in all of us. The, the desire to protect your buddy if you see him wounded or threatened uh, is there and you will, you, that instinct just automatically comes out. But now, in our training, we were trained at, now some people might call it brainwashed and if you choose to use that expression, that's okay too. I, I don't feel that way. Uh, I felt we were going into a foreign country who was occupied by a communist force who was a threat to the United States of America. Uh, so if you say I was brainwashed, then maybe I was, but I guess there was a lot of us that were because we, we felt that we were patriots. Uh, it, it, it's not easy to look down uh, the barrel of a weapon and there's another live human being on the other end that you have zeroed in and you know your orders are to take them out. But when you have ammo flying over your head and you see your buddies killed and you've seen them tortured, uh, one of the things that happened to us was the Battle of Quezon. Uh, we were the first air cab special ops group. We went into um, Quezon after the North Vietnamese had overrun the Marine units that were there. We saw hundreds of American soldiers that had been tortured. At that point, you become so angry, so uh, calloused uh, and determined that, that that's not going to happen to another one of your buddies. It's not going to happen to you. And so at that point, it's like anger takes over. And so it was a real struggle at times to know who was the enemy and who was not the enemy, especially you go into a village. Yeah. Um, there were times when we would get outcoming fire from an ambush, or maybe a sniper, and we would have officers, officers that would call in artillery on that whole village. Was it right? No. Uh, but somebody was firing at us to take our lives out, and instead of putting our lives on the line, they just eliminated the whole problem. Um, I, I'm sure that we've all heard the stories of Lieutenant Kelly and My Lai, the massacre that took place. Um, that's war. There's always going to be uh, casualties of war. But as a, a combat veteran, um, when you see one of your, your close compadres go down and his life ends, you, you want to try to even the score. And uh, it doesn't make it easy. And it took a long time for me to, when I came back to the States in the real world, uh, when you come back over the pond, as we call it, from Vietnam to America, and I flew into Seattle, Washington, um, to this day, I can walk out in society and uh, I see a guy my age, I can tell you immediately whether he was in Vietnam or not. There's just a certain look. There's a certain contact with the eyes. And you know whether he was in combat or not. It, it's just a part of our makeup. I was very fortunate to have uh, a loving family, uh, a loving wife, uh, a good church family, a strong faith that uh, I don't think at any point I've ever experienced post-traumatic stress syndrome. A lot of guys did and do. Uh, I think that strong faith and that love that I, I received when I came back from my family is what got me where I needed to be. Now, I'm not saying there weren't hard times. Yeah. There were. Well, I, I 
really appreciate you sharing that with me. That means a lot. Uh, I, I say that because uh, maybe sometimes we, uh, we, if we've never been in a situation, uh, we can, we, uh, and this is this is why I always say this. You know, it's one thing to read a book, but it's another thing to ask somebody that was there, and you were there. And so a lot of times it's it's easy to second guess. Well, I wouldn't do that. Or I I couldn't do this, but you know you can't really say that because you weren't there. And so that's what this this uh, this is about is 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 talking to people who are really there. And it's, sometimes we need to understand what somebody. It's easy to say that you wouldn't do anything when you're in your safety of you know wherever you live. But you, when when the when things get bad, you have to put people your, yourself in other shoes. Well, I think we all want to we all want to live. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we're willing to preserve. Uh, our dignity. I had a guy ask me uh, just recently, he said, now, do you have a concealed carry? I said, yeah, sure. I think most veterans do. I carry a weapon uh, probably 90% of the time. Uh, what would you do if you had to use it? I would use it. Reluctantly, yes. But if it meant saving an innocent person in society, uh, I, I think I'm well enough trained that I could, I could, you know, probably hit somebody in the shoulder, or arm, or leg. But let me assure you, when you're put in that situation, you don't think about where you're firing. You usually go for, for mass, and, uh, and you go to take that person out. It's not to just take them down casually. As a Christian, that's a hard thing for me to, to sit here and say, uh, no, I don't want to see anybody no. die. Uh, but at the same time, I believe we have to protect our own and our, our and I think the Bible backs this up, to be honest with you. I think, you know, I think, uh you would know that you know the we talk about since you you brought uh, faith in that the, there's a difference between murder and there's a difference between killing. People say thou shalt not kill, but it's really thou shalt not murder. True. And I interpret it that way. And, okay. And people are going to say, well, that's just your way of looking at it. I, in fact, I had a pr professor at uh, at David Lipscomb College years ago that I worked with and I loved dearly. Um, say he could not if somebody was breaking into his home, he did not feel like he could take that person out. And I told him, I said, let me assure you, you would. It's just a natural instinct. Yeah, I think it's easy, easy to say that you wouldn't do this, do, do that. But I think from what I, the people I've talked to is the way you feel now when you're safe and I'm sitting here and we're drinking water or we're talking is different when somebody is trying to make you leave this earth, murder right. you. Well, you know, we've got a rough situation in our, our country and our world right now. And I think a lot of the veterans that you probably talked to and are going to talk to will, will tell you, uh, would you do it all over again? Yes, in a heartbeat, because I, I, I believe that much in our country as a patriot. Uh, I had the privilege of being with some really neat guys. In fact, I served uh, several combat assignments with Oliver North. Uh, and of course, a lot of people know Oliver oh, North yeah. because yeah. the Iran Contra thing. Uh, but he, Old Blue was, was uh, a great soldier. He is a great patriot, and he still to this day goes to Afghanistan and uh, other places to be with our troops and interview them. Uh, and I, I admire him greatly, and he would tell you the same thing. He was a gung-ho soldier. And, you know, we hear all this uh, talk about Air Force, Navy, Marines, National Guard, or Coast Guard, and the Army. Uh, when you're in combat, there's no distinction. You're all soldiers. You're there for a reason, a purpose, and you protect each other. Yeah. Now, when you're going through training, and you hear the states, you get into a bar fight, that's a different yeah. thing. You kind protect of, your own. It's kind of like a, a jesting, like, well, it kind of like a, yeah. it's like, well, I'm better than you, you're better than me, you know, kind of like uh, my football team's better than you, or we can do this better than you. But when right. it comes, to, when it thinks comes to, push comes to shove, that you've already got the yeah. piece back. Uh, so, I think you brought up a point that I've talked to other people that's been in harm's way, and you know, this maybe goes to even people in law enforcement, there, are especially people that have been in the military, something like you, is people, uh, a lot of times they forget that we live in a world and not everybody wants to get along with us, and not everybody wants our best interests. And I think I've seen that mostly with veterans, that they understand that not everybody in the world doesn't, you can't talk to everybody, you can't, you know, everybody doesn't want to be your friend and everybody doesn't want to have your best interest in mind. Some people are just 
not not good people. Well, you know, we're taught from early on there's right, there's wrong, there's good, there's evil. And the people who look at us as infidels and as evil today in our society, uh, they want to exterminate us. They want to wipe us off the face of the earth. Well, if you're put in a situation where you have to make a a quick decision, what are you going to do? I think that's pretty obvious what you're going to do. You're going to protect you and you're going to protect your own and others around you. Yeah. That's how, what's one thing that I hope maybe uh, people get from these interviews that I've interviewed is uh, that the uh, people can live in peace in Bowling Green or wherever it is because of people actually, people like yourself and other people that I've interviewed and other veterans have uh, uh, brought the fight to other people and, and done things. What kind of kills me is, you know, we've got a lot of people that just bury their head in the sand and want to pretend that, you know, this is not affecting me. And yet, they don't understand how 10,000 miles away in a, a war zone, those kids that are over there right now in Afghanistan, they're protecting our freedom. And there's going to be always debate about, well, what do you mean protecting your freedom? They're over there. They're not here. Well, the trickle-down effect of how the world operates and, and our economy and everything that goes with it uh, affects us. And, and we're spoiled. Americans are spoiled. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who came from uh, uh, Nicaragua, who is our uh, Latino minister, just last night that we were having supper together. And uh, he said, Bob, this is like Disney World. You know, I grew up on a dirt floor. We had pigs running around, chickens running around where we ate. And he said, I came here, and it was like, my, you know, I've died and gone to heaven. And third world countries don't have what we have. No. And I'm afraid unless some of these blessings, as I choose to look at them, are taken away from us by force, by alien force, by the enemy, so to speak, we're never going to realize how valuable they are. And that's one thing that I think every soldier that's been in combat will tell you. When they came home, no matter whether they were wounded or they, they had something happen to them, horrific and they had to make adjustments to deal with it, whether it was losing a limb or, or a mental struggle, emotional struggle, uh, they're going to tell you there's no place like this country. You know, even uh, even uh, even people who have never been in combat, I know my father always said that people in the military, they had some skin in the game, and like when you see the flag, it, it, it means something to you. It does, and when I hear Lee Greenwood sing God Bless America, I, I, I still get really emotional. You know, when I see these so-called million-dollar pro football players protesting down on one knee, it, it rips me apart. I think you don't realize you've got all of this because of what that red, white, and blue flag stands for, and uh, men and women have paid the ultimate price. I think it goes to show that, you know, if we live in a country that there's other countries that if they did that, they would be drug out back and maybe put, put in prison or shot. I don't think we're hated by the world as much as a lot of people want to make it. Yeah. You know, the news media seems to play it up really big that we're not liked that much. But uh, I can remember driving down Highway 1 in, in Vietnam and little kids on the side of the road waving, waving and yeah. waving American flags. Now, admittedly, yeah, some of them may have had a, a, a Chinese grenade, grenade that they yeah. would throw at us yeah. at some point, but they were trained to do that. Yeah. But the other ones were appreciative. I remember going into one village where we had inoculated all of the uh, people in the village, and, and the Papa San, was what they referred to him as the chief of the village, came and hugged all of us. And unfortunately, later on, we found out that the Viet Cong had come in and killed everybody in the village. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, but still, I think people in the world where America's been and is do appreciate what we're trying to bring and give them, which yeah. is freedom. I remember sometimes you see in Afghanistan and Iraq, the soldiers, all the little kids go up to the soldiers and they give them candy and soccer balls sure. and stuff. I mean, so that, you know, they, they see those as like the, the, somebody's here to protect us and take care of us. Right. So once you uh, you left Vietnam, where did you where did you go from that? Well, I flew into uh, Seattle, Washington, and because of uh, the stuff I, I was involved in while I was overseas, I uh, went into a room, it was pretty dark, uh, sat down in a chair, there was a light shining on my face, kind of like this one is right now, yeah. uh, and a gentleman on the other side tried to uh, encourage me to 
once I got out of the military to go to work for the government. And I thought seriously about it. Uh, there was an offer of a great deal of, of tax-free money that would have been given to me to sign on the dotted line. I would have to go to Quantico and I would have to go into additional training uh, to become an uh, enforcement officer for the government. Uh, it didn't really entertain it too long. I, I was anxious to get home to you my your, wife and you my had family. Your, you had your feel of... Yeah, I had my feel, and I, I didn't want to pursue that any further. I just felt like, you know, that's going to be a whole dark direction I don't want to go in. Uh, is there a place for that in our society? Absolutely. I think people who are very naive don't understand uh, the way the government has to work in order to protect our freedom. Uh, and I appreciate all those men and women who do serve in special operations with the government outside the military as well as the military. But I, I uh, said no. Then, at that point, I had three months left to go in the military, and uh, I thought I was coming home. And I went into a barracks, was called out, um, was ready to come home. I mean, just, you know, wore out tired. Yeah. They sent me to Seoul, Korea, on special assignment. And I flew into Seoul, uh, went to the Yongsan compound where they assigned me to, stayed in a S-1 office for three months, did paperwork, which was uh, basically interrogating uh, men and women who had been captured by the South Koreans to uh, potentially spies. And uh, so finally got out of that, got back on a plane, three months later flew home, killed my wife and, and family. They thought I was coming home. I thought I was coming home. They were written to me. I was getting early out. But uh, it didn't work out that well. But then after going there and coming back home, I, I flew into Louisville. Uh, my wife and family met me there, and I tried to adjust back into society. That was a, it took a good six months to a year to, uh, most people here, uh, the, the so-called hippie generation, I guess, did not like us, and, and uh, Did you ever, did you have, have anybody that gave you a hard time because of your I service? I was called a few names, which I'd rather not mention, yeah. but anyway, uh, did it make me angry? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe real angry. Uh, if you'd seen your buddy put in a, a, a black bag and zipper zipped up and shipped back home to his loved ones, it, it would make you angry real quick. Get to see what was going on here. It was hard to see in the news the demonstrations and the flag burning and the draft cards and all uh, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, you know, I'm, I'm not just talking to you, but I'm talking to all Vietnam veterans that, that I'm, I'm, I'm really. I, well, I think that. our country is made up yeah, for it. I, I, hate I, that happened, I, yeah. I really think that uh, they have tried to make us feel welcomed and, and have tried to repair that damage yeah, that was done. That even to this day, you know, down at the, the Hot Rods baseball game uh, last week on Memorial Day, they had a special military acknowledgement for all veterans and, and present military. And it feels good. You know, I yeah. think now we're very proud of what we did. Uh, we were ordered to do it. Uh, I. The only regret I have is that they did not allow us to finish the war. We we won every battle we were involved in, but we lost the war because of politicians in Washington. Yeah. And I don't apologize for saying that. If they don't like it, that's tough. Yeah. Uh, but but and, and I feel for these guys in, in Afghanistan and the gals that are there and the ones that were in Iraq. Um, I guess today my question that I would really want to ask is why? You know, I look at the wall in Washington of all the guys and, and people that their names are on that wall that died in Vietnam. Why? What What did it gain us for 10 years of combat? What came out of that that was good that we could point our finger to? Uh, I don't see it. Yeah. You know, I, I remember I watched uh, on specials, they showed the, the, uh, the, the uh, Tet Offensive. Right. And uh, the, the United States won, they, the, uh, we won the Tet Offensive militarily. And they showed uh, Walter Conkright, he said, this war cannot be won. And I'm like. But there was a great price that was paid yeah. for winning that battle, oh, the yeah. Tet Offense. Yeah. We lost a lot of people. Yeah. You know, but I, you know, maybe this is, maybe I shouldn't get into this, but I feel as though maybe the, the, the media kind of were like, he was always put in the air and people were put in the air. I'm like, and they, they talked to the guys on the, on the ground. I'm like, what are you talking about? We won. How can you say that this can't be won? Well, my personal view is the, of the uh, 
news media is still doing the same thing today. You know, I don't think there's any respect for our military by the news media. Uh, I, I, I do believe we're on a, an upward trend. I think, I think we're rebuilding our military to be uh, the force that it's capable of being. Uh, but I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. I think just I just really thought, I always thought that that was struck my mind how how demoralizing that would I don't know if he really thought about how what he said that was really demoralizing the people that it, 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 when we came home we flew into Philadelphia uh, and and I saw guys in army uniforms fortunately like I told you earlier I, I was not in military uniform when I came back uh, I was in civvies in fact the three months I had left to Korea I never wore a uniform. So I got my hair was longer, you know, and, and I didn't look the part of quote the military guy, and and I heard things there at the airport that just really flew all over me, and uh, and it's just an unfortunate thing. Yeah. Uh, in, in closing this uh, interview, if the people are watching this, what would you have them to uh, get from this interview, and what is your military service? Military service, how has it affected your life today? If you can have have the floor and say anything you about this interview, what would you? Probably first of all, uh, I, I think it made me a better person. Uh, I don't know what road I was going down when I went into the military. I feel like it was a pretty good road. You know, I was raised in a good Christian family and had a good job, was in school, had a great wife. Uh, but there were things that took place in, in that period of time in my life that, that was more valuable than three PhDs. Uh, when I came back, I went on back to college, got my degrees, went and got my advanced degrees. Uh, but still, I reflect back on those two years as the, some of the most important times of my life. Uh, my two children, uh, my son and my daughter and my grandchildren are, are patriots. Uh, they love the American flag. Uh, they, they, every Veterans Day, I get cards, calls from them uh, telling me how much they appreciate that, that I served. They respect our nation, and I would want people to just take a hard, a real hard look. But the, the freedoms that we have in this country today, uh, there's been a, a, a big price paid. Uh, there's a song that was very familiar by one of the country music guys: "Some paid all, and all paid some," and uh, that's true. And so today. When we're driving down the road on interstates in a brand new car and living in nice homes and watching 500 channels on TV <laughs> and eating a thick steak, you know, it, it's pretty nice when you stop and think about it. There are people in the world that are eating rice out of a bowl and they're lucky to get that. So uh, maybe we need to, to stop and count our blessings. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you think uh, by being in uh, Vietnam, did it make your faith stronger? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, there were struggles while I was there. Uh, I admit, there were times when I asked God why. Uh, there were times when I came home the first two or three years after that, I said, you know, why did all this have to happen? Why are all these, these guys dealing with what? And today, even today, we have military guys and, and gals that um, they're struggling. And, and that question can't help but come up. Why? But it, it has made my faith and, and my, my convictions much stronger, uh, determined to help my fellow man. Uh, when I see people today that uh, are struggling, there's just something inside of me that wants to, to help them some way, whatever it might be. Turn, turn that tear into a smile. Yeah. Uh, and I think that all came out. Uh, when I was in high school, I was kind of a wallflower. You know, I played all sports and did all that kind of stuff as a part of the team, but I wasn't outgoing. I wasn't an extrovert today. My wife would probably say I'm a little bit over the edge of being an extrovert. Okay. Uh, but that's okay too. I think everybody has its place and uh, everybody has characteristics that they contribute to society. And um, uh, I just want to do my part as long as I'm still breathing and here and try to make this world a little better place. Can you talk for a minute? Like you said, you were ministers. Can you? Did you say you were an active minister now? I've been in the ministry for, well, I got back here in 70 and 72, and I'd made a promise to God while I was overseas if, if I got back in one piece and uh, was somewhat mentally uh, alert, I would, I would give him my life and uh, time. And uh, so I started uh, 
preaching for a little country church up in Edmondson County called Shady Land Church of Christ. And at that point, I realized I really wanted to do that for a livelihood. And um, I told a couple of my friends, professors at Lipscomb in Nashville, that uh, they heard of a church that was looking to let me know. And uh, I got a telephone call from a place up in Illinois. And I went there for a few years and then back to Nashville, Tennessee, and later to Dallas, Texas, and Birmingham, Alabama, and then back to Bowling Green the last umpteen years I've been okay. here at the University Heights Church. Um, and we run a food bank at our church now, and that's probably been the greatest blessing uh, since I've been in the ministry of just helping people who are in need. It's not about the numbers. It's about one plus one plus one. And if you can do something to change a person's life, that's, that's all you're here for. Uh, do you have anything else you'd like to maybe add to you? I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'll admit when you called, I was a little bit hesitant. I thought, well, this may conjure up some things I don't want to remember, but uh, I think I've coped with those pretty well through the years. I had a lot of help. Uh, uh, like I said, uh, a strong faith and good family and good friends uh, who've understood me. And regardless of how I acted or what I did, they loved me anyway. So yeah. that's a pretty good feeling to have. And I appreciate you uh, uh, giving me a call. And well, me well it to. was an honor for to sit here and, and interview. I was really looking forward to it, and I really uh, appreciate your, your service. It means a lot for you to share your story. Well, thank you for the invitation. Yeah. I hope it helps somebody. Yeah, thank you.